how do you weigh the top predator of the ocean, the killer whale? SeaWorld in San Diego, California, has the massive task of managing the health and well-being of seven killer whales. They all play the role of Shamu, the star of this marine life park. Today, they're weighing their second largest killer whale. She's over 20 feet long. She's one of our most experienced whales here at Shamu Stadium. Since the whales live at SeaWorld, the trainers are responsible for their care. And that care requires monitoring the weight of each animal. We take weights on the whales weekly, and we use all of these weight measurements to monitor growth rates and apply this knowledge to populations of killer whales out there in the ocean. An adult killer whale can grow to more than six tons. So the scale used to weigh these mammals has to be tough enough to handle a truck. It's different from your bathroom scale, which uses levers and a spring to measure weight. The scale is comprised of a platform that sits atop six individual load cells. Each load cell consists of a piston, a base, a clamp ring, fluid, and a diaphragm. When the whale is on the scale, the piston puts pressure on the diaphragm and the fluid. The fluid transmits the pressure change to the totalizer. The totalizer sums the pressure signals and converts them into an electrical signal, which is displayed as the whale's weight. Reading the display is the easy part. Getting the whale onto the scale is a bit trickier. The way that we would teach the scale behavior is we would simply use our hands and place them in front of us, get the animal to come up and touch our hand with their rostrum. We'll communicate to the animal that that's exactly what we want them to do by blowing the whistle. That just means yes. Each step along the way, we're going to be bridging, communicating to the animal that that's what we want them to do, and reinforcing the animal for that correct behavior until eventually we have them sliding up completely onto the scale. And we get a final weight of 8,125 pounds. That's awesome, Shamu. In 1303, British merchants introduced the Averdupois pound as the mass standard for the imperial measurement system. The Averdupois pound was the weight of 7,000 grains of wheat and was divided into 16 ounces, just like the modern US pound. But today, the standard for mass is the International Prototype Kilogram, or IPK. The United States copy of the IPK is maintained by, you guessed it, NIST. The International Prototype Kilogram is a platinum iridium artifact that looks just like this one right here under this bell jar. At the time when the kilogram was manufactured and sanctioned, 40 replicas were made and distributed to the signatories of the meter convention. An object's mass is the same no matter where it is, while its weight changes as a function of gravity. In early trade, merchants would balance carob seeds against goods because they were thought to be naturally of a standard size and mass. When weighing devices came along, like two pan balances, they used the carob seeds as a counterweight to measure things like the weight of precious stones, like diamonds, and so that's where we get the term carat. As it turns out, carob seeds aren't all that stable in nature. They're really not that much different from a lot of other seeds. And in fact, there's about a 23% variation in carob seeds size and weight. Dishonest traders would often take advantage of the situation. So I might have the larger, heavier ones, 50 of them, for one use, and 50 of the lighter ones for another use. For instance, if I were buying, I'd use one set, and if I were selling, I think I'd choose to use the other set. Of the seven basic measurements monitored by NIST, mass is the only one based on a physical object. The IPK and its replicas were forged in 1901. In 1989, physicists charged with maintaining it claimed the artifact had changed by as much as 50 micrograms. It doesn't sound like much. In fact, it's about the weight of a grain of salt. But that shift was more than enough to have groups reliant on accurate mass measurements, worried about the consequences. We metrologists are very greedy in our measurements. We like to keep track of every microgram of every fraction of a microgram if we can so we can detect things with very high precision so that you know what you're buying and you know what you're measuring exactly the mass and force group at nist 
has set out to minimize the slight instability in the mass of the kilogram. The main thing that needs to be done is one needs to have a definition that is not based on an artifact because then you eliminate all possible sources of instability. There's a worldwide effort dedicated to relating the kilogram to phenomena that exist in nature, like those for length and time. These projects involve complicated calculations, but suffice to say, the Avogadro project will attempt to count every atom in a new kilogram artifact. The watt balance will try to define it with electronics. We want to create the most perfect measurement that can exist that we can trust for long times to come. After all, 50 micrograms probably won't make a difference when Shamu gets on the scale. But it may affect the exacting method by which pharmaceutical companies manufacture drugs. It takes a large scale to measure the weight of